legacy is defined as A, B, C, D in quotations, page number. The best way to define it is that. And if you don't find the definition, then you build and argue for it. But this is another example. As you go through the literature and you comprehend it, also make sure you write yourself the right notes. And this is what happens to our brain when we think about um, uh, doing uh, problem solving in the brain. Okay, This is, a, I think, an MRI. Uh, so applying the literature, obviously. We talked about demonstrating, illustrating, solving. The idea of, of relating, classifying the literature in terms of what larger blocks they belong to. In terms of, of classifying, we give another tip. If you want to look at certain, if, you, if your research is around some constructs or concepts, it will be very beneficial for you to do this table where you understand where papers are addressing certain areas of, of research. I'll give you an example. Let's say your research has to do with risk that is related with electronic medical records, okay, or implementation success, or implementation success of uh, electronic medical records. And so you create these concepts and you start creating, uh, one concept can be risk, the other one can be uh, uh, the components of IS success model, and then you start seeing where they are crossing in some articles between the constructs. So you see, you already have a couple of papers that might very quickly, you can eyeball, oh, they touch the two areas, they touch three areas, they touch four areas. Some of them are only in one, er one uh, concept. And so going through that map can visualize you, to you, you can actually visualize it very quickly on where you can use certain articles, where you can apply the articles, the literature, to a certain areas as you go through the literature and argue. And of course, analyze is taking a problem or taking a larger piece, breaking it into a smaller sub problems or sub issues. In this case, is thinking about the literature. If you have a bigger problem, you want to break it into smaller pieces. We talked about it in my group about how we take a larger problem and we start breaking it into smaller problems and then we start looking at articles, in this case, not necessarily solutions, but articles that contain some ideas or constructs or measurable things that are related to the solution. So you build it up. And the idea, obviously, is that once you combine it all together, the sum will be larger than the parts. Of course, that's your own original contribution. So here is an example of the synthesis of the literature. Okay, and this is just an example, and I on purpose changed the references to some of our own faculty, uh, so you see their names as well. But the point is to, as you go through a paragraph, and I've seen this all along, I, I get a literature review piece or an argument for a problem or an argument for the need for the study, and it's all paragraph after paragraph using a single source. Okay, if it's a single source, you don't synthesize the literature. All you do is annotations. You just tell me what that paper said. You don't combine and weave in those pieces of literature to create something that is larger, which is your own contribution toward as an argument. Okay? And this is a process that you need to learn. It's, a, again, a learned skill. Okay? And as you go through the process of writing literature uh, literature review or arguments for uh, scholarly papers, or you go through the process of reading a lot of good quality literature, you're going to learn that as, as time progresses. And of course, evaluate. And so the idea is uh, to evaluate the literature uh, in, in the literature, the essential evaluation in the literature review is to clearly distinguish and this is a typical thing we discussed yesterday, between opinions, the theories, and the empirically established facts. These are crucial things that you got to understand. And as you write, you need to be very precise. Because when you write, the way you write, you got to be precise in saying, is this an opinion? Or is this according to so and so? They believe that means that it's an opinion, right? 
or according to so-and-so based on a study conducted using 50 companies. You can see where the empirical area comes or based on theory, right? It's the example I have here is the uh, brain-computer interface that we saw before. Uh, the assumption is that you will need to wear something like that to com control your computer. But essentially, all you need is something like that to control your computer. So way less complex than what you might think. So in terms of the processing, of course, I went through it quickly. But I want to uh, recap of the steps that are interlocking, as you notice, each other in the process. And when you get to the point where you actually evaluate after you synthesize and you evaluate and you understand also to distinguish and when you write you distinguish between those opinions to facts to theories that are uh, guiding you're ready to actually produce uh, the output and of course we discussed this yesterday and all of you should have it written somewhere on your uh, on your notes and stick it in front of you when you go through your uh, dissertation process uh, says who based on what. Okay, this is crucial because if you don't remember this, you actually in inject a lot of anecdotes into your writing, and you're going to be grilled very quickly by your uh, advisor or committee members for doing that. There are certain places where it's valid. I'm not going to have enough time to go into argumentation theory. And this is a crucial thing. I'll just tell you. Quick uh, note about it is that when I went through, and those of you who took my class know it, and when I went through my PhD, uh, one of the crucial phases that I went through my dissertation defense, uh, my, um, my proposal defense, is um, to come and actually argue uh, for a certain study that I proposed, which later on I had to change, by the way, because they grilled the hell out of me and they decided <laughs> this is not going to fly. Obviously, I did not do a good job in arguing for that problem and arguing for the research, the need for the research. And the output of that meeting was that I need to go and take a class from the law school on how to better develop arguments. And that was one of the best classes I've ever taken. And if you have any choice to go and take some of these classes or educate yourself online, on the argumentation theory. Those of you who are working with me, there is a book that I'm referring. This is the book that William and called The Craft of Argument down here. And it's also cited from the paper. Um, and essentially what it is, this is a book that used in law school to teach them how to build an argument in a, in a case in court. And if you learn the pro the, a good process of argumentation, if you learn how to argue for the problem, if you learn how to argue for the need for your research, the process is very similar of what they do in law. Okay? And obviously, when I finished that course, it was over the summer. When I finished the course, I redesigned the study that I wanted to do, and I properly defended the proposal. I actually had a very good comments coming back. That was a very good course that I was very happy to uh, take, and I learned a lot in terms of the argumentation. In the paper, if you read that paper, there is a whole chunk that talks about the pieces of the argumentation theory, the, the claims, the reasons, the evidence, the acknowledgments, respo uh, responses, warrants, etc. cetera, and, and there are other areas of... of uh, um, indications for that. Uh, as you go through, there is also a process of crafting an argument. I'm not going to go there, but uh, uh, as, as our time is limited, I want to go over also and review some of the homework. But uh, what I want you guys to take away from this is that as you go to write your literature review, as you go to write an argument for your problem, as you go to write any, any piece that you're writing, you make sure that you have that sequence of arguments that make sense. And to start it, you've got to build the structure. 
the best way that I told my group is to create some kind of a bullet list of how your arguments is built up and then develop each bullet into a, a statement, two statements, three statements, and that will weave into paragraphs that you're going to build later on. That is the sequence usually Dr. Ellis and I are building any paper that we write. Okay, we start with that, that structure and then build on that. We infuse definitions, we infuse all those reasons or any other areas that we need and obviously all the literature supporting that. One last thing I want to touch before we're moving on is the ethical issues in using literature and in using literature sources. We're all grown up and we're all stressed up in time and sometimes it happens that people use the wrong references. The point is to make sure that you don't use it on purpose. Make sure that as you go through, uh, you present your text that you're not obviously going into any of the unethical uh, engagements. I don't need to tell you that, but w it's very important for our school and the quality of our programs to ensure integrity and I want to uh, just mention this as, as an important piece. So when you go through it, ensure that you're properly quoting, you're following APA in that regards, you're using the right references or citations in the right to say the right things, not using references to things just to have it on paper, etc. Because you might be surprised when you're advisor or a committee members or someone who read will go and will check that source or will verify or they know that source and this piece does not, was not argued there or is not supported by that paper. So these are the areas you gotta look into. And I'm gonna uh, stop here for a minute. If you have any questions or comments before I, I move